Um, so gender dysphoria in children, from the art of medicine to institutionalized child abuse. Um, I think one general uh, concept that I hope we've gotten across this conference is that medicine does not occur in a political or moral vacuum. We are not just a technical profession, but a moral profession. We tell people, we use the science to tell people, our patients, what is, and then we use a whole person view, we, we use our, our world view, our philosophy, theology, our understandings as a whole person to make recommendations to our, pers uh, to our patients, what should you do? Science tells us what is, not what we should do. And that's why I've opened with this slide. We're gonna keep it in mind. I'm starting with this slide. Nietzsche, of course, we saw in a previous, um, previous presentation and the fellow down in the lower right hand corner is Thomas Aquinas. Dr. X from Alaska called me through the American College of Pediatricians, um, very irate at our administrative assistant one morning saying that we are damaging children. How could we possibly be, um, we were so transphobic and she wanted to speak with me immediately. Um, <laughs> Fortunately, I, my office is several states away from our main office, so, uh, <laughs> but Lisa did connect us, and I ended up having a very civil conversation with this very well-meaning uh, pediatrician, and in the end, she, she said, Dr. Cortella, y you know what, or at this point we were first names, so she said, Michelle, Michelle, Let's say you're right. Let's say that no one is born transgender and that this is all a massive experiment with hormones and surgeries on children. Let's just, I'll concede that, she says. But why impose cisgender heterosexuality? Why should we impose this? I want, to keep, I want you to keep that question in mind as we go through and we will look at the science and we're gonna come back to it at the very end. Okay, I think it helps if I do that. I know this will come as a shock to everyone in the room, but sex is real. I am a woman, you know, we are men or women. There really is nothing in between. Um, the most recent study that demonstrates this quite well um, was out of a group from Israel. They identified 6,500 genes between men and women which are expressed differently, and this is an open access um, journal, so you can pull it for yourselves. Um, this is particularly important since it explains why men and women respond differently to pharmaceuticals, uh, among many other things, of course, but personalized medicine, it's, it's in our genes. <laughs> Sex is not assigned at birth. Not, not myself or any of my colleagues have ever been in the DR and assigned a sex to a baby. Sex declares itself, and for several decades now, it typically declares itself in utero on ultrasounds. And, and it kills me that our feminists uh, through the 70s um, mainstreamed gender. They very effectively got us to use the word gender when we really mean sex. Uh, when I was growing up in the, in the 70s and I took uh, standardized testing, we weren't asked as little kids to, to, what is your gender? It was, what's your sex, male or female? It was very clear. Um, but now we have introduced a very political term when we really mean biology. So sec the sexual binary is in our DNA. What about disorders of sex development or so-called intersex? I have seen some writings, in the lay literature anyway, saying that intersex conditions are as common as red hair. Please, you know, give me a break. Uh, if you go to the International Society for Intersex Conditions of, of North, uh, actually it's the Society of North America uh, Intersex Conditions, one in 2,000 live births is how often you generally need to call in a geneticist to say, I've got ambiguous genitalia, can't tell, you know, which, is this a, a boy or a girl? We have to do further um, diagnostic testing. Here's the key that I always explain 
to any audience or individual I'm speaking to, this is a biological disorder. Why can we say it's a disorder? Because we implicitly all know and agree that we have a binary. The norm is a binary and intersex is a disorder. It's diagnosable. There is no medical or psychological test for so-called transgenderism. I can't find it in your genes, cannot find it in your brain, and I will talk about brain studies later on, cannot find it in your blood. It's in the mind. So what's with this word gender? And I, I think this is our biggest problem in this uh, whole issue. Gender, if you, and I did this, because I, I actually was interesting, I received an email one day um, from a gentleman on our side of the argument, and he said, Dr. Cortella, you're missing the boat here. You've got to go all the way back to Samuel Johnson's first dictionary and come forward, and you're going to see that this whole word, it's just been completely socially engineered. And, uh, and sure enough, if you go back to the 1700s, um, the number one definition of gender applied to grammar, not people. It applied to grammar, and the, the second option, it did refer to sex, male or female, but typically referred to breeding animals. It wasn't until the 1950s when we had our wonderful, you know, Harry Benjamin, John Money, uh, basically sexologists who wanted to profit from sex reassignment surgery, chatted with each other and said, you know what, we can't change people's biological sex. We're, we're referring to our patients as transsexual and we want to do these sex reassignment surgeries, but we need a word that you know, we, we can justify doing these surgeries with. And they decided to hijack the word gender. The 1950s is the very first time gender appears in the medical literature referring to people. And the definition they gave was, we are treating the, sec the social expression of a person's internal sexed identity. Now this definition, while not explicitly used by proponents in medicine for the new put kids on, on hormones model, that is the implicit definition they're using. They are arguing that there is an internal sexed identity that plays out uh, and that we are all born with this. And I already explained that in the 70s, the feminists added the idea of social sex separate from biological sex, saying, yeah, this is what gender means. It's a behavioral, cultural, psychological phenomenon. If you look in the DSM and in uh, psychological literature, the most common definition you find for gender is the psychological and cultural characteristics associated with biological sex. Now, again, psychological and cultural characteristics are not found in your DNA, are not found in your hormones. It's, it's a whole gamish that's, that goes into it. Um, and as I noted, you know, DSM-5 does refer to both sex and gender being assigned by us meany, political act, uh, politically ignorant doctors. We, we do this to our patients. Um, Gender identity, DSM, identifies as uh, how a person socially identifies themselves as either male, female, or other. My friend Paul McHugh, we need to keep this in mind. The reality is when you're talking identity, whether it's gender identity or anything else, identity is in the mind, not in the body. What is normal gender identity? And, and here, when I say gender, I'm talking about awareness of our own biological sex. What is gender identity development? What does that normal development look like? Well, we have many studies that demonstrate that babies can start to distinguish between men and women in utero. So that by, um, by four months, uh, four months in utero, uh, Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> in utero, they can distinguish voices. Their mother's voice, of course, they know quite well. 
from four months gestation, um, we do have evidence of that. Um, by six months after birth, they can distinguish male and female voices separately, as well as male and female faces. At 18 months of age after birth, they start, babies start to uh, bond and identify more with the same sex parent. Very important for gender uh, identity, as we heard from, uh, from Mr. Doyle's uh, own personal experience. Lawrence Kohlberg is more, um, most prominently associated with moral development. He also has um, a cognitive developmental theory for gender identity, which has played out and is conveniently being, now being ignored by the transgender activists. Um, what you will find the activists quoting to you all the time, and I'm including my fellow medical colleagues in this, is that kids know their gender identity by age two age three the latest, oh yeah, they know it all right. What they're not telling you is something that all parents, grandparents, and pediatricians should know. Kids are kind of impressionable, right? Kids don't really come out with hardwired um, upper level thinking and um, otherwise, why would they need us? So <laughs> what Kohlberg looked at was an understanding of gender stability. Meaning, do children understand that if I'm a boy, I will grow into a man? If I'm a girl, I will grow into a woman? And he found, you know, for the most kids, it's not until age four that you understand gender stability. What is most concerning in light of what is now going on in preschools and elementary schools is that young children don't have a sense of gender constancy until age seven. Constancy is the understanding that if I have a man and he puts lipstick and a dress on, if I have gender constancy, I understand that he's a man with lipstick and a dress. A young child under age seven may honestly believe he just turned into a woman. So this is normal cognitive development that is being ignored. And this is happening across the nation. We have public libraries hosting drag queens. We also have schools hosting drag queens to read to children from the ages of three to eight uh, about accepting gender fluidity. And this book, there are so many books. I mean, if you really want to get sick, you know, on an empty stomach, Google gender, go to amazon.com and Google uh, gender books for children, and it's, it's nauseating. Just do it on an empty stomach. The book in the center I took out because it's a picture book designed for preschool and kindergarten introducing Teddy. Long story short, Teddy is a male teddy bear with a bow tie at the beginning of the book. Teddy is Tilly, by moving the bow tie to his hair at the end of the book. Okay, now in, again, in light of the normal cognitive development we talked about, this is damaging, potentially, and very likely damaging to children. I get calls from parents in school, uh, school systems quite often saying, Dr. Cortella, can you and the College of Pediatricians help us fight these curricula in our school systems? Um, and the most recent one, which did make headlines, uh, Rockland Academy is a private school in Rockland, California. And for an entire year of kindergarten, I will just call him, this is not the actual boy in the picture, but I will call him Joey, was five years old, along with all his peers. He went through the entire year of kindergarten as Joey. And around the last day of school, um, Together with the kindergarten teacher, the parents had arranged a coming out ceremony for Joey. And the kindergarten teacher brought the whole class to the rug. She read the red crayon, which is a crayon that's actually blue, but is covered in red. And it, it, it primes the kids to start to think, oh, you know, gee, maybe labels don't really match what's underneath. And then she read the story, I Am Jazz, and I'm sure many of you are familiar on the TLC channel, 
Jazz Jennings, who from the age of three, a biological boy who was raised as a girl, was go, uh, put on puberty blockers prior to age 12, started on estrogen prior to age 16, and uh, is, has been depressed and on anti antidepressants all the time, was just told, oh, we're sorry, you have a micro penis and we can't, we can't fully transition you to male. And yet, despite this all being on television, broadly available, he, Jazz Jennings, um, and his family are held up as, as idols and, and poster people, with poster, she's a poster child for the transgender movement. Um, so in any case, these were the books read to the five-year-old children, and then she had Joey stand up and say, okay, Joey, go out of the room and you come back in. And as you might be able to guess, Joey comes back in a dress and the teacher says, Joey's really a girl and, and you're gonna call him Josephine from now on. Needless to say, kids were confused. They went back to their parents and the worst case was, or most severe case, um, the mother, Ariel, I had the, the opportunity to speak with, she reached out, her daughter that night came out of the bath with her hair slicked and she walked past the mirror, saw herself with her hair slicked back and burst into tears. Mommy, am I turning into a boy? Because I don't want to turn into a boy. And it just burst into tears, bawling. And then told, that's how the mom found out what happened. Um, most of the other children uh, also blindsided their parents saying, you know, this is what happened? Like, how does this, in, what was interesting to me was in, in the local papers, they did share Ariel's story and her daughter's experience. And, uh, but of course they favored the experience of another family, a Hindu family. And they interviewed the father who said, oh yes, I was quite surprised when my daughter told me this story at dinner and she asked me, daddy, how, how does this work? And he um, said, oh, well, that's this God so-and-so who puts souls into people, and sometimes he just messes up. And his daughter was satisfied with that. And of course, the irony is, as I'm sure you all know, we can't be teaching religion, you know, we can't be promoting religion publicly or in the schools, and yet this newspaper, everyone just thought that explanation was wonderful. and. Um, and, and he, they ended the article with he and many other parents are quite happy that um, their children will be taught to be loving and tolerant. Um, there's been significant backlash uh, from parents who are more, who are sane and <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Getting back to terminology, uh, DSM-5, the, the battle in Rockland is not over, I will simply say that. Uh, DSM-5, transgender terminology uh, is just absolutely mind-blowing, it's incredible. As you can see, transgender refers to a broad spectrum of individuals who transiently or persistently believe that there's something other than their biological sex. And could we be any more broad in our definition? Um, transsexual, a person who actually has undergone both hormonal and or sex reassignment surgery, so they're committed to living as the opposite sex. Um, in adults, cross-sex hormones, which would be estrogen or testosterone, as well as sex reassignment surgery, is considered the standard of care, but not required to identify as transgender. And we'll see it's considered the standard of care with no evidence further on. Um, childhood gender dysphoria refers to children who are prepubertal and they have gender identity confusion. Now, prior to 2007, the majority of therapists, physicians, and I would say the general feeling out in, among the public was that, you know, if thoughts are not aligned with reality, that's abnormal thinking. Identity that is not aligned with your biological sex, that's a sign of a problem. Sure, maybe it's a passing stage in a very young child, maybe it's just confusion, but this could also be a pathology. The goal was to affirm your child 
as the unique and wonderful, lovable boy or girl they were born. Some families would do this with watchful waiting. Some families would enter therapy together with their children. When this happened, by, based on the clinical case studies, especially with the work we received from uh, Dr. Zucker, over 75% of these children would accept their biological sex by late adolescence. Naturally passing through puberty would suddenly wake, awaken many of these students to the fact that, hey, yeah, I really am a boy or I really am a girl. So nature tended to take care of this well over 75% of the time. If you look to the DSM-5, um, they report that in boys, up to 98% of boys would accept their biological sex, and as many as 88% of girls would accept their biological sex. What happened in 2007? Well, gradually, the adult transgender movement was riding on the coattails of the LG, LGB movement in pushing for um, so-called civil, their own civil rights, I would say invented rights. Uh, and they were doing this by promoting the we're born that way. You know, uh, you heard biological men saying, I'm, really, I'm a female essence trapped in a man's body. And so by 2007, this myth was increasingly being promoted and absorbed and accepted. And it caught the notice of Dr. Uh, Mike Bailey, who uh, psychologist, an expert in gender and sexuality issues. He is LGB affirming, but he was always critical of the transgender phenomenon, quite frankly, because he, he treated them. And uh, he did publish this excellent article in Perspectives in Biological Medicine in which he takes on this myth and um, exposes that, you know what, this is a treatable condition. And by promoting this myth, we are not being true to science, nor are we helping our patients. The more, as it relates to pediatrics and what we're seeing now, the more important thing was that converged also in 2007, Dr. Uh, Norman Spack was, uh, had gone to the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, researchers in the late 90s had started experimenting on children with puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. Their research was not good. Uh, small numbers, they pretty much acknowledged that the risk of harm was significant. Norman Spack, however, went to their clinic and you can find an article from the Boston Globe, an interview in which he is quoted as saying, I was salivating over this. We had to bring this protocol back and do it. Um, that's a literal quote. You can find it online in the Boston Globe. So he somehow got approval to open the very first gender clinic in America at Boston Children's Hospital. And had gender uh, children who fit the diagnosis of gender identity disorder would come to his clinic and they would be encouraged along with their families to live as the opposite sex, socially transition. And then, uh, not surprisingly, initially these children are very happy because they really want to be the opposite sex and now you're telling them, yes, we're going to encourage this fantasy you can change your name and we're gonna make everyone else call you that name and cross dress and, and so forth. So as they approach puberty, they realize that their bodies are gonna be changing. That causes significant anxiety, depression, distress. Um, and so the solution for Dr. Spack, following the Netherlands protocol, we're going to suppress puberty uh, generally by age 12 uh, cross-sex hormones, you see, we're going to buy you some time, he's arguing, we're going to buy the children time to think out what they really want to do. Are they really a boy trapped in a girl's body or vice versa? And if they decide by age 16 that, yes, they really are the opposite sex, then we go ahead and give the biological boys estrogen and the biological girls testosterone. And if you're a girl, hey, and you take testosterone every day for one year, by age 16, 
you can get a double mastectomy. Let's just take a step back and look at this from both, uh, I call it the politics of diagnosis and treatment. To this day, if I walk into your office, be it a therapist or a physician, and I say, I really want my arm cut off because you know what, I'm a disabled person trapped in an abled body. I will be diagnosed with BIID. But if I walk into your office, be it therapist or physician, and say, hey, you know what, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, and I want to, no, I said that wrong, didn't I? I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. I want you to cut off my breasts. I could potentially sue you if you say no. I probably wouldn't win at this point, but it's coming close, right? Because with the Obama administration, in fact, they did have a mandate that said you must affirm your transgender patients. Now that, that mandate was repealed with the Trump administration, but that's where we're going. So depending on what body part you wanna cut off, that determines whether or not you're diagnosable. I mean, if, um, yeah, since, and body dysmorphic disorder. I think Dr. Patrick mentioned body dys dysmorphic disorder in the past. There are people who are convinced they are ugly um, we acknowledge that no, you know, this is, this is a mental disorder. Um, anorexia nervosa, Dr. McHugh has held that up as another example. We don't tell them, oh goodness, you know, yeah, you were born this way and yeah, the, we have to ease your distress by providing you liposuction. No, we only take that approach with gender identity disorder, which has been renamed gender dysphoria. Why did the team do that in 2013? because they want the focus to be not on normal or abnormal thinking, but on treating distress. So if the person with gender dysphoria gets rid of their distress, they are no longer diagnosable. They no longer have a problem. The problem is the emotional distress, not the abnormal thinking. So once we fell into that trap with adult transgenderism, the moral imperative that the adults put forward was we have to save these so-called transgender kids because we really are born that way. <clears throat> what are the claims to justify social transition as well as medical tr uh, pharmacologic treatment? Here's what is said. Brain studies prove that gender dysphoria is innate and unchangeable. All you need for diagnosis, if you have a three-year-old in front of you, or any age, but you know, take age three, who consistently and persistently insists that they are not their biological sex, that they are something else, so consistent, persistent, insistent, that's sufficient to diagnose them as born transgender. And what pediatricians, what the gender experts are telling families is that, oh, your child has a body and brain that are not on the same page. We'll get into the brain studies a little bit in a moment. Um, families are also told, number two, if you don't support your child in this way, they're gonna kill themselves. We have to do this protocol because it's the right thing to do. They're gonna kill themselves if you don't. Um, they're, uh, and then they're following that up with, and transition, social transition and the blockers and hormones improve mental health. We have proof of that, they claim. And you know what, oh yes, it's true. If you put a very young child on puberty blockers and follow that up with cross-sex hormones, yes, they will be permanently sterilized, but you know what, it's, you're be better off alive and sterile than dead. And we already know that sexual reassignment is safe and effective for adults is again what's put forth in the mainstream media by the gender experts and told to the parents. Newsflash, brain studies actually prove nothing. And this is very important. Number one, there's only a few. Uh, they're not replicated. The idea, uh, Remedy et al, found that the white matter microstructure of female to male transsexual adults more closely resembled that of men than women. Um, other studies found that the brains of transsexual adults 
fell somewhere between the two sexes. The important reason, the, the, the most important point is down at the bottom to understand that these are not only are they very small studies that have not been replicated, they are one point in time. If you want to prove causation in terms of brain development and structure, you need studies that are prospective starting just shortly after birth, are serial, longitudinal, randomly sampled, representative of the population, right? You need your fixed set of individuals, not even close. So is there something else we can look at? Oh, before I get to that. Uh, what we do have are several replicated studies demonstrating the phenomenon of neuroplasticity, meaning we don't have any evidence of um, brain structure that stays the same from birth through adulthood, but we have a whole ton of evidence of brain structure changing over the course of life as a result of behavior and thinking. So if we ever do get studies that replicate the earlier ones showing, oh, there's a difference between this transgender individual and this non-transgender individual, the more likely scientific explanation is that this adult who has lived as a transgender person has actually changed their brain through their behavior, not the other way around. The other thing to consider is that baby boys in utero, unlike baby girls in utero, have testes. And they start secreting <coughs> testosterone, usually at eight weeks gestation. The girls are not exposed to this because no female infant has testes. So babies at birth, they're not born with the wrong brain. I mean, you know, you could argue maybe if mom was exposed, uh, you might have had a hyper um, testosterone, additional testosterone, but no, normal development. And when we talk about transgender individuals, these are individuals who have normal chromosomes and they have, they have normal hormone indices. Let's look at basic behavioral genetics to answer the question, are complex behaviors hardwired before birth? Any honest behavioral geneticist will tell you that, sure, genes and prenatal hormones influence behavior, but they don't hardwire a person to think or feel a particular way. It's nature and nurture. Twin studies give us an idea of the relative contribution. What is more important, pre-birth factors or post-birth factors? An example, if you have something that's 100% determined by genes like skin color, your identical twins are gonna match 100% of the time. <clears throat> if you have a trait such as puberty onset, which is very significantly determined biologically, but not solely, your concordance rates of identical twins is 90%. So the best, largest study we have of transsexual twins finds the following. <clears throat> Identical twins match in their transgender identity only 28% of the time. 72% of the time, they're different. What does it mean? All right, vulnerability. Predisposition is not destiny. It also tells us something else, that 72% of what accounted for transsexualism in this population, 72% was determined by post-birth events or in, influenced by. So let's take a look at the politics of twin studies very quickly. I pulled some data on anorexia nervosa. The concordance rates among identical twins for anorexia, 44%. Much higher than the 28% of tra in transgenderism. What do we tell patients with that higher rate, if we, relatively speaking? Oh, oh, it's, it's sure, it's biological influence. We can help you or we don't bring up biology at all, more than likely. Transgenderism with much lower concordance rates, meaning significantly lower biological predisposition. It's genetic, you're normal, innate, immutable, March 4th. 
psychosocial factors predominate. Parents have a tremendous impact on the emotional lives of their children. And we know this from attachment theory going way back, Bowlesby and Ainsworth, which everyone seems to have conveniently forgotten. When you look at the literature, parent psychopathology is extremely high in families with children who have gender identity disorder, gender dysphoria. We are also seeing in the teen population significant psychopathology and increased rates of autism predisposing to gender dysphoria. There are also um, social contagion. There are whole cohorts of teenagers who come out as transgender together, often after binges on social media. Um, these are studies documenting the psychopathology and autism in uh, teens, the spikes, which we have noted as political activism has increased um, and saturation in the culture, so have these spikes in adolescence. And it's been found throughout the world, not just in the United States and Canada. Eric Erickson, we also seem to have forgotten about this fellow, spoke about the adolescent phase as being a psychosocial crisis of identity formation versus role confusion. We are now holding out a mental illness. We're holding out gender identity disorder as a cutting edge identity. And in fact, in research, adolescents have told researchers that it is very cool to come out as transgender. Is suicide inevitable? Again, looking at the past literature, if 75% to 95% of your children are coming out accepting their biological sex at the other side of puberty, the vast majority are obviously not killing themselves. And what we do know about folks who do complete suicide, 90% of those have a diagnosable mental disorder. So this is a problem. The rate of natural resolution is a problem for our activist pro-trans MDs. So now they're trying to rewrite history and say, oh, that was all bad data. Yeah, that Dr. Zucker and Steensma, oh, no, no, no. They didn't have those great success rates because you know what? The children they were treating, they were only gender nonconforming. All right. Uh, Davida Singh and Ken Zucker himself went back, reanalyzed the data, bottom line, their patients did, the majority of their patients did meet full GID criteria, and even their children who were sub-threshold for GID, there was no difference in terms of who, uh, percentages who would identify as transgender. So their overall desistance rate of 88% was, is factual. Is transition safe and effective for adults? Suffice it to say, objective evaluations, Hayes Incorporated is a, is a corporation that analyzes effectiveness of various medical therapies and um, have no interest in finding one way or the other. Um, no, it was very weak. There's very weak evidence to support sex reassignment surgery. And the Endocrine Society, by the way, has found the same thing. They've still come out in favor of this uh, dangerous protocol. But admittedly, there is only a weak base even in adults and practically no base for children. Here you see that they were looking at cross-sex hormones in adults and there's inconsistent evidence, very sparse evidence of any improved quality of life. There's significant long-term safety risks uh, which have not been conclusively ruled out. Literature for kids, this was in 2014, is too sparse and the study is too limited. Despite that, we now have well over 40 gender clinics for children and every single of the 215 pediatric programs are pushing this. There have been two very small studies that have come out suggesting that social affirmation, social transition and hormones are good for children. Studies prove no such thing. Why? Up front, they define these children and they're confused. Let's face it, if you have someone who comes in and consistently and persistently insists that they are a kumquat, is that, does that make for a diagnosis? No, that makes for a delusion. So up front, these studies are assuming what genetic studies 
already disproved. They're assuming that these kids are born this way and it's normal and their confusion or delusion is, is mentally healthy. You can't do that and, and describe this as an objective scientific experiment. So that's bad enough. Then it's small numbers, it's short term. Parents rate the emotional and mental health of their children. Little conflict of interest there. Oh, and the siblings of these transgender children are the control group. No confounding factor there. Um, is there evidence of harm in youth from transition? I, um, my friend, Dr. L, uh, has two descriptive studies which she hopes to get published in the next six months. One was um, a descriptive study interviewing 164 um, different parents from different families about rapid onset gender dysphoria in their teenagers. And she does document harm, um, worsening of mental health both in the children and within the family. She has also found 100 young adults who detransitioned after teen transition and they, their treatment dates from the early 2000s forward. Um, and, and that's in part because the, these kids can actually obtain uh, drugs, hormones on the black market. Through There are many websites that actually instruct children on here's what you need to say to therapists, here's what you need to say to doctors so that they will go along with your transgender identification and here's where you can mail away for hormones. So this did happen, some of this did go on before 2007. Um, I do go through the pubertal suppression, which I know I'm going to, I'm going over, so I will uh, speed through. Hopefully, my, this full report with all the documentation of the protocols is in um, the issues in law and medicine. So the G, um, GNRH agonists, these are the blockers, obviously they prevent secondary sex characteristics, but the most important thing that everyone seems to ignore is that Sex hormones impact brain development. And remember the so-called reason we want to arrest puberty is so that these children have time to process and really think and consider, are you kidding me? We're arresting their brain development. And P.S., there's something else very obvious here that was being ignored. If you arrest their bone growth, their secondary sex characteristics and their brain development, what's happening to their friends? Their friends are progressing normally. So I have just physically and psychosocially isolated my patient from his peer group or her peer group. And in fact, these gender doctors were hearing from their patients that they were distressed and they were feeling isolated. But you don't find that actually reported. No, what the gender doctors are saying is, Age 16 is way too late to go through puberty. Uh-uh, we need to get these kids on cross-sex hormones so they can go through the right puberty right from the start. And without any um, official endorsement, many gender doctors, they, might, they, they post it on Facebook, actually. I mean, that's how ridiculous this is. They, so many gender doctors around the world and across the U.S. were posting on Facebook, Joe Kennedy Olson is the foremost one in the US out in LA. Yes, I put my patients on puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones simultaneously between the ages of nine and 12. So she is immediately sterilizing them. All right, they, now, mind you, what's the party line? The party line is blockers are totally reversible. Yeah, if you take the, the GNRH agonist away, sure, puberty will ensue. But if you have that, what I want to say to these guys are, hello, if you have a child who's on a blocker for two years and you take them off, can you give them the two years of life back? No. You have irreversibly, potentially irreversibly harmed them right there because you don't have a time machine to give them two years of normal puberty back. These all ignore that. What, what is interesting is that the AAP, uh, American Psychological Association Handbook, warns against social transition um, because there is at least one good study, Steensma 2011, that demonstrated significant emotional harm 
can result just from allowing young preschool children forward dressing as the opposite sex and they decide, oh no, I want to go back. The, pubertal, uh, the puberty blocking protocol, there is only one study in the literature that follows them out um, beyond, five, the, beyond five years of puberty blocking. 100% of those kids requested cross-sex hormones, so we have 100% who became sterilized. Which suggests, hey, this is probably a, a self-fulfilling protocol. Permanent sterility. Risks of estrogen to natal boys, cardiovascular, um, prolactinoma, breast cancer. Um, the biggest impact is on glucose re regulation, um, hypertriglyceridemia, and cardiac risk. Risks to girls who are put on testosterone, uh, very similar. Bad cardiovascular uh, risks increase and uh, unknown effects on girls' breast, ovarian, endometrial uh, tissue, insulin resistance, and of course, as I said, one year after being on daily testosterone, they can have a bilateral mastectomy. All right, so sex is real. We have to have a normal, a definition of normal thinking. Delusion doesn't fit that. The majority of children, if you allow them to pass through natural puberty, will accept their biological sex. Social impersonation and pubertal Suppression is most likely a self-fulfilling uh, outcome, and we're condemning these children to face a lifetime of being on very toxic, sterilizing hormones. So it's not fully reversible or harm harmless. We are allowing children who have no cognitive or neural, ca neural capacity to possibly process risk and future outcomes. That alone makes it a violation of first do no harm. Uh, and I, I, I know I've gone over. Can I take five minutes? Okay, five minutes. Thank you. I have to share this story because I, I was absolutely outraged. Um, Dr. Joanna Olson Kennedy uh, is married to a psychotherapist, and this gentleman is a biological XX person. They met at a trans activist conference. Joanna Kennedy Olson gave the opening remarks at the U.S. PATH conference this past February, which is the U.S. Professional Association for Transgender Health. She got up to the podium and she said, I'm going to share a story with you about one of my patients. And she relates that she had a mother come in with her eight-year-old girl. The eight-year-old daughter had been bullied at her religious school because the daughter... I'll call her Julie. Julie preferred the male uniform to the female uniform. She also preferred to keep her hair short, and she was getting teased by girls in the girls' room. Why this mother wasn't able to address this with the teacher or other parents, I don't know, but the mother took her daughter to Joanna's uh, gender clinic. So, uh, now mind you, the, the girl was basically a tomboy, but never expressed a desire to be the opposite sex. In the office, Joanna asked her, oh, Julie, are you a boy or a girl? And Julie said, uh, I'm a girl. Like, you know, I've got, got the equipment, I'm a girl. And Dr. Joanna said, hmm, do you like Pop-Tarts? Julie loves Pop-Tarts, eats them every morning. Well, all right. If I gave you a strawberry, a, a strawberry Pop-Tart, or at least, you know, that's what the package says, it's a strawberry Pop-Tart, and you open it up, and you take a bite and realize, oh, this tastes like cinnamon. Is it a strawberry Pop-Tart or a cinnamon Pop-Tart? And Julie's face, kind of, her eyes kind of got big, and, and she turned to her mother and said, Mommy, I think I'm a boy in girl foil. This was her opening comments, and she, and she said, this is what we have to do as pediatricians. We need to help our patients find the words to express themselves. Coaching and grooming anybody? These are the experts driving the standards of care. 
Parents are losing their right to protect their children. Parents are being threatened with child protective services by physicians and therapists for refusing blockers or mastectomies for their children. Nine states, Washington DC and 12, uh, 24 counties have banned psychotherapy for both gender identity, uh, gender dysphoria and sexual orientation. I have been contacted by six separate families, <coughs> parents going through divorce, various states. The, in, in each case, it's a 15-year-old girl involved who had absolutely no gender dysphoria symptoms until the divorce was filed and parents were, it, it was not, I mean, divorce is never good, but, um, and one parent saw quite clearly that this was depression and reaction and trauma to the divorce, wanted the child to go through therapy. The other parent said, oh no, we agree with her because the, gr the girl and the, the guardian med litems and the therapists who were consulted said, oh yeah, she's transgender. The judges in every single case awarded medical decision making to the pro-trans parent. Why do I call this institutionalized child abuse? I think it's pretty obvious to the audience now. We are, and this is a psychiatrist friend said, just referring to what we're doing in the school systems, we're gaslighting our preschoolers and young kids. We are robbing them of their reality testing. I mean, let's face it, what's the first physical reality we encounter as infants? Hopefully it's our mothers. One of the others, our physical bodies. If we cannot trust the reality of our physical bodies, what can we trust? So we are, we are seriously, cognitively and psychologically damaging our very young children. Puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, we are chemically castrating and sterilizing them. And then age 16, if you're a girl, yeah, go ahead, mutilate your healthy breasts. And PS, surgeons who profit from these surgeries are pushing to allow, to, to change the laws, to allow bottom surgeries or genital reconstruction under the age of 18. And um, I apologize for not having this reference, but in a, a very recent article in a peer reviewed journal, two, uh, two surgeons argued for this saying, um, age is just a number. We don't need to wait to 18. It's just a number. These kids know who they really are. We, we should be able to help them by doing the bottom surgery sooner. And so I submit to you that this is not a scientific debate. This is a debate of worldviews grounded in neo-paganism and atheist secular values on the one hand versus teleological worldviews um, which is predominantly found, or certainly in the monotheistic, especially Christian traditions. If you do not believe in teleology and intelligence being observed in nature and the human body and design, then truth and science, science is not a tool of discovery. It's a tool to manipulate things. And what we have fallen prey to as a culture, in addition to all the isms that we heard about in this, this weekend, it's a radical autonomy. You know, it's the woman's right over the child's right to life. It's the patient's right to end their own life or to demand that physicians participate in killing them. It is feelings that we're treating and we have the right and the duty to chemically alter our children and physically alter our children. So, thank you.